I want to lift a word in your hearing, the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Luke chapter 15. I want to lift verses 1 and 2 in your hearing. If you're with me, say amen. If you're not, say wait. The word of the Lord reads as follows. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Amen. Be seated. I want to thank Bishop Clark for being a gracious uncle in ministry. It's been a tremendous blessing to my life and ministry for the entirety of years that I've known him. Thank him for this gracious introduction allowing me to come practice preaching at the First Church of God on this Sunday morning. I thank Bishop Clark, but I also thank some friends of long standing who have gathered here on this Sunday morning to be with their friend and brother. And your presence on this Sunday morning is greatly appreciated. I bring greetings from the Watchtapel Baptist Church, Raleigh, North Carolina. Bow with me in a word of prayer. Your words, my mouth. Use me to be a blessing to your people. Let your word fall on fresh and fertile ground. Remove every distraction and obstacle that might get in the way of us hearing from you. Your words, my mouth. In Jesus' name people of God said amen. Amen. amen 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 I want to preach as the Holy Spirit shall give me help from the topic living with criticism living with criticism among many things our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth is known by his names. For those of us who are familiar and acquainted with the Bible in its entirety and the New Testament in particular, we are acquainted and familiar with the names of Jesus, Alpha and Omega the author and the finisher of our faith, savior of the world, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, king of kings, lord of lords, heart fixer, mind regulator, burden bearer, bridge over troubled waters, shelter in the time of storm, the way, the truth, and the life, Emmanuel, light of the world, bread of heaven, son of the living God, Beloved Son in whom God is well pleased. We know Jesus by his names. We also know Jesus by images and illustrations that have been used to describe who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what Jesus will do. According to this familiar text that contains some of the most popular and well-known parables in the New Testament, Jesus' name is not explicitly given bishop, 
but rather Jesus is implicitly described as a masterful model, an extraordinary example. As Jesus is described as the Son of God who has come to seek and save the lost. On the flip side, Jesus, because of his gracious ministry and association with those who are the least lost and left out, Jesus becomes persona non grata concerning the scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law. The scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law, first church, hate Jesus. Someone who has come to broaden the horizons of grace, reach those who need to be reached, and compel those who need to be compelled by the grace of Almighty God, the scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law, according to verses 2 of chapter 15 of Luke's gospel, are muttering and murmuring because Jesus fellowships with sinners and has the audacity to eat with them. Jesus were really a holy orthodox Jew, Reverend Dudley, he would not corrupt or compromise his character by associating with people who are scandalous, skullduggerous sinners. But because Jesus, according to Luke 19.10, has been sent by God to seek and save the lost, he is willing to associate with those who are the least lost and left out. If you allow me to pause parenthetically, I'm glad that we serve a Savior who looks out for the least lost and left out. If you'd be honest with yourself on this Sunday morning, that's my crowd, the least, the lost, the left out people who have not dotted every I, have not crossed every T, who have not done everything right across the journey, people who don't want everybody to know where God has brought them from. Thank God for the grace of Jesus who was willing to associate with sinners. As Jesus associates with sinners, Scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law have declared Jesus worthy and deserving of condemnation, criticism, and hateration. Jesus becomes the object of condemnation, criticism, and hateration. The text bishop says that Jesus lives in the midst of criticism. And while Jesus is criticized, Deacon Harris, Jesus lives victoriously in the midst of criticism. Despite being condemned, verbally abused, hated, criticized constantly, Jesus yet lives victoriously in the midst of criticism. And as a masterful model, an extraordinary example, Jesus teaches you and I, First Church, how to live victoriously in the midst of criticism. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ who takes your walk with God seriously, you too will be subjected to criticism, condemnation, and hateration. I wish I could tell somebody that following Jesus were a Sunday drive in the park. I wish I could tell somebody that following Jesus would exempt you and absolve you from criticism, hate, and condemnation. But no greater lie has been told. If they hated Jesus, they'll hate you. 
If they talked about Jesus, they'll talk about you. If they called Jesus everything but a dirty dog, they'll call you everything but a dirty dog. If they'll hate on him, they'll hate on you. But praise and thanks be to God, like Jesus lived victoriously, you and I can live victoriously in the midst of criticism. Despite how folk talk about you, you can still live victoriously. Despite what folk say about you, you can live victoriously. Despite folk rolling eyes, sucking their teeth, assuming the worst about you, not the best, we can live victoriously in the midst of criticism. Help me preach this word like I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina First Church. While Jesus lived victoriously in the midst of criticism, let's be honest with ourselves, most of us have a hard time living victoriously in the midst of criticism. We have the capacity to smile, but we frown. We have the capacity to live victoriously. Yet if the truth be known, most of us are not yet living victoriously in the midst of criticism. When we criticize, we become angry and get annoyed. When we criticize, we become defensive and discouraged. When we criticize, we sulk and shrink back. When we criticize, we pout and pack it in. When we criticize, we become mean, mad, and moody. When we criticize, we wonder and wonder whether it's all worth it. When we criticize, we internalize it or become immobilized by it. When we criticize, we become vengeful and vindictive. Most of us, if the truth be known, are not yet at the point where we are living victoriously in the midst of criticism. But thanks be to God for the example of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ who when criticized does not fuss and fight. He didn't become resentful or retaliatory. He doesn't become mean or mad or moody. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't fight fire with fire. He doesn't return hate with hate. He doesn't return condemnation for condemnation. But he lives victoriously with his head held high, joy in his heart, peace in his mind, pep in his step, verve in his spirit, living victoriously, doing the work of the kingdom in the midst of criticism. Preacher, how can I live victoriously in the midst of hating Helena? Critical Cassandra, demonic Demas, and folk who have nothing good to say about what I do for the kingdom of God. We live victoriously, First Church, in the midst of criticism when we learn to evaluate the criticism. Jesus is living, doing the work of the kingdom, seeking to extend a ministry of grace, not legalism, to those who are the least lost and the left out. Jesus has learned, Bishop, to evaluate the source of the criticism and evaluate the truth of the criticism. Can I preach this? Sometimes we automatically become defensive and discouraged by criticism, yet we have to press the pause button in our spirit, not rush to judgment, and take the time to evaluate the criticism and the source thereof. Can I preach this to the real folk, to the grown and spiritual who know that every criticism is not a source of hateration, condemnation, or to degrade you? If you live long enough and walk with God, there are some times we need God to send some people in our lives who will be consecrated critics and speak the truth in love. Everybody 
who criticizes you, who speaks a word that is not flowery, that sometimes bite is not a hater sent from the devil. Sometimes God will send truth tellers, consecrated critics, to speak a word into our lives lest we kill ourselves or ruin what God wants to do in our lives. Can I preach this to the real folk in the room who can testify? I thank God for the people that saved me from myself by speaking a word I needed to hear when I needed to hear it, how I needed to hear it. How many of us are so honest with ourselves on this Sunday morning to admit I would not be where I am unless God sent some Nathans, some Elijahs, some John the Baptist to speak a word of truth lest we lose our minds or kill ourselves. Let me see if I can make it plain to somebody. Y'all sit down too soon. Amen. Uh, once upon a time, there was a king by the name of David. Man after God's own heart who happened to see a fine black woman by the name of Bathsheba. Ain't nobody saying amen. And we know the story. Amen. But praise be to God for a preacher, prophet, Pastor Dudley, by the name of Nathan, who told a story, a parable that convicted David to the point. Out of that context, we have Psalm 32, Psalm 31, and had God not sent Nathan to correct and chastise David, David would have never become who God called him to become. You got to evaluate I'm not done. There was a black preacher by the name of Martin King Jr. God sent to speak a word of truth to this nation called America. Thank God for the constructive critique of Martin King. Had Martin King not spoke a word to America, those of us who are black by birth, saved by Jesus, would not have the rights that we enjoy right now. Had God not sent Martin King to speak a word to America concerning social injustice, there would not be a Civil Rights Act of 1964, a voting rights Act of 1965, a Fair Housing Act of 1966, or a Freedom Act of 1968, and many of us would not have the jobs we have, wouldn't drive what we drive, couldn't live where we live, enjoy what we enjoy. Thank God! Living victoriously in the midst of criticism requires that we evaluate the criticism. Every word of critique is not an act of hateration. Sometimes we just got to get out of our feelings and evaluate the word of critique. Not just evaluate the word of critique, but if I'm going to live victoriously in the midst of criticism, I have to expect it. I wish I could tell you that we would be exempt and could avoid criticism. Wish I could tell you that if you were a good, holy man of God, woman of God, got up on time, minded your own business, stayed in your own lane, nobody would criticize you. No greater lie has been told. You wake up in the morning, put clothes on, make your way to first church, somebody got something to say.
wise as a serpent, tender as a dove, expected. This was not the first time Jesus would be criticized, nor would this be the last time Jesus would be criticized. Criticism was a constant stream in his life and ministry from the time he was conceived according to those who question Mary's virginity and sanity. Not the first time. Won't be the last time. And Jesus lives victoriously in the midst of criticism because he has learned to expect it. And I want somebody to leave First Church with your big girl stilettos on. Your big boy Tim's on. Leaving the sanctuary of First Church with your head held high because you have learned to expect criticism. I don't always like it, but I've learned to expect it. Won't always feel good about it, but I've learned to expect it. Won't always appreciate it, but you've got to learn to expect it. If you go any day in your life expecting that you will not be criticized, you are setting yourself up for denial and delusion and naivete. If you're holy, folk call you a holy roller. If you're smart, folk say you're acting white. If you speak Ebonics, they say you're too ethnic. If you know how to code switch, folk call you an Oreo. If you're expressive in worship, they say you don't take all that. If you know and read the Bible, Folk call you a Bible thumper. If you vote conservative, folk call you an Uncle Tom or an Aunt Thomasina. If you're liberal, folk call you ungodly or atheistic. If you support HBCUs, folk say you ain't living in the real world. If you work hard at your job, folk say you need a life. If you are team no drama, folk call you a square. If you walk by faith, Folks say you a doggone fool. If you're upbeat and positive, folks say you're naive. If you're patient and count the cost, folks say you procrastinate. If you got dreams and goals, folks say you're ambitious. If you smile, folks say you're crazy. If you don't smile, folks say you're too serious. If you love God, you a doggone fool. Whatever you do, how you do it, you got to expect it. Expect it. Expect it. Dress too long. Colorful shoes. Expect it. Live victoriously in the midst of criticism because he evaluates it. He has learned to expect it. But he lives victoriously, Bishop, in the midst of criticism because he is encouraged by it. Blessed are you when men shall revile you, say all manners of evil against you, but for my name's sake. We got to arrive at the point, first church of God, that we got to be encouraged by some criticism. If I'm criticized by some people, I'm on the right side of history doing the work of the kingdom. If you do the work of the kingdom and are committed to being who God wants you to be, the scribes and Pharisees will have something to say. 
Consequently, if the scribes and Pharisees are muttering and murmuring about your inclusion of sinners, then you ought to be encouraged by their critique, hateration, and condemnation. If some folk clap for you, you're doing something wrong. If some folk are saying amen, we are doing something wrong. If some folk are cheering for us, we are doing something wrong. If haters are hating, then sometimes that means we are doing something right. I wish I could call the roll on this Sunday morning. When Pharaoh critiqued Moses, Moses found encouragement. When Bull Connor critiqued Martin King, Martin King found encouragement. When Ronald Reagan critiqued Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter found encouragement. When Herod critiqued John the Baptist, John the Baptist found encouragement. When David was critiqued by Goliath, Goliath found encouragement. When Jackie Robinson was critiqued by Ty Cobb, Jackie Robinson found encouragement. When Mordecai and Esther were critiqued by Haman, they found encouragement. When naysayers critique you, you ought to find encouragement. When haters critique you, you ought to find encouragement. When the pessimists critique you, you ought to find encouragement. When negative Nelly don't got nothing good to say, you ought to find encouragement. Sometimes we ought to be encouraged by who is doing the critique. Let me see if I can make it plain for somebody. Uh, the other day, Dr. Dudley, I'm in the mall, and I saw a young woman that said, be motivated by your haters. Or in other words, let your haters be your motivators. Somebody right now in the sanctuary of First Church doing the work of the kingdom, committed to doing what God called you to do, ought to be encouraged by your haters and encouraged by your motivators. Let me see if I can close and make it plain. During the pandemic that started in March of 2020, me and a few friends of mine developed the habit, Sister Thelma, of walking a 5K every day, 3.2 miles every day. We walked 5K every day and while we were walking the 5k every day we discovered a particular dog at a particular place on our journey and this dog was unique sister gail because the dog would only bark when cars were moving if cars were standing still the dog had nothing to say if cars were in park, the dog had nothing to say. If the car was not moving, the dog had nothing to say. But as soon as somebody would put their ignition in Joe, as soon as the dog heard a car begin to move, the dog would begin to bark and act a doggone fool. As long as the car was stationary, Nothing. But when a car started to move, somebody sees where I'm going. The dog began to bark. And the more progress the car would make, the louder the dog would begin to bark. When the car would begin to move, the car would act like the dog would act like he was chasing the car. Dog can't do nothing with the car, but the dog is roof, roof, roof chasing the car the car is stationary come on walk with me the dog ain't doing nothing but as soon as the car bishop begins to move the dog begins to bark come here somebody as long as you stationary they don't have nothing to say long as you ain't going nowhere ain't got nothing to say long as you stuck where you are ain't got nothing to say but as soon as you begin to move they begin to bark begin to holler begin to scream and if the dog begins to move that's a sign you're moving in the right direction come here somebody get your groove back put your shoes on 
go back to school. Keep on moving. Let the dogs bark. Let them holler. Let them cuss. Let them hate. Keep on moving in the right direction. Somebody ought to be encouraged because when you're moving, dogs begin to bark. Dogs begin to scream. They begin to holler. But that's a sign you're moving in the right direction. I wish I had some help here. Don't let your haters discourage you. Let them motivate you. Live victoriously in the midst of criticism. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still pray as I onward bow. Lord, plant my feet. Plant my feet on higher ground. Higher ground. Keep pressing. Keep driving. Keep believing. Keep on going. Keep pressing. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged.